All right, everybody, welcome back live at Drew's House, another edition. Hope everybody is doing okay. Well, I am so excited about this show. Uh, it's not too often that you have a couple uh, Olympians on the show, and that is exactly what we have here as of just a, a couple days ago. Hours ago, these two unbelievable athletes qualified for Tokyo, um, which is just fantastic. Applause, Christy Wagner and Jevy Stone. Christy coming to us from New York, Jevy from Cambridge. How are you, you two? Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So you're like just removed from qualifying, right? This is unbelievable. How uh, did you kind of know you might be going? Like, was it uh, was it close? What's the deal? It was a fast field this year. It was six boats that looked to all be about the same speed. Only four even make the final, and we knew we had a shot and could go fast. But it's a thrill to actually do it and to get across that line first. <laughs> I know there's like a bunch of, what is the actual race that you are specializing? Because there's like a bunch of them when it comes to rowing, but what's the, what, what, is, what are you two in? Uh, we're in the women's double, um, but right now in rowing, it's all 2,000 meters. We race 2,000 meters, so okay. same distance, different boat classes. All right. It's a very, it's a very physical sport. I'm thinking you two must be very tired after qualifying for Tokyo. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <I'm tired today. laughs> Jeffy, what was it like? Was it because uh, I think I actually first got in contact with you when you were driving back from qualifying? Uh, emotionally drained, physically drained, all of the above? All of the above. I mean, it's a weird balance between being extremely excited and feeling that energy and also just being exhausted from the emotional and physical toll of not just the final, but the entire week uh, of racing. Um, Jebby, not your first go around, correct? This will be my third Olympics, yeah. That is unbelievable. Um, we'll talk <laughs> to me about too. That. <laughs> What's that? To me too. <laughs> really, it still feels surreal. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. What's? Uh, I mean, you must get to a point where I mean, the first one you're probably ecstatic. It's your first experience, and you're like, oh my goodness, I've done this twice. And now three times, you're a veteran. Yeah, I'm getting very old in the world of rowing. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I was thinking, but okay. <laughs> Christy, how about how about for you? What's this is a new partner for you? Or yep, and this is my first Olympics, and Jebby and I only started rowing together four or five weeks ago. So four or five weeks ago? Yeah. All right. I'm not too. I'm obviously not too familiar with this sport, so you're probably laughing at some of my questions. But is that unusual? Yes. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. It feels unusual. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we you picked a good partner. <laughs> We both raced at um, the first Olympic trials in rowing was in the single, and we both raced there as well. So um, then we started rowing the double after the singles trials. Well, have you crossed paths, Christy, like throughout your careers here at all? I'm sure you were friendly a little bit maybe, or I, I don't know. Yeah, a little bit. Um, but this was definitely the first time that we had ever gotten in a boat together or, you know, trained together, so... Yeah, I think we that? raced each other in 2017 at doubles trials against each other. And then the first time we really talked was probably March 2019, when we were both training in the same place for the period before trials. And then, yeah. yeah. That part's fascinating. Now, Jebby, is it like, you know, so many sports, you know, team chemistry is so important. Is there such a thing in rowing? I imagine there is, where the chemistry just doesn't click and like, and in this case, it just works? Yeah, it's not only, I mean, the chemistry is hugely important and trusting your teammates. And then there's also the rowing side of it. And with one other person matching physically and matching how you move a boat is really important. And Christy and I almost magically are about the same height, about the same proportions as far as legs to torso and row in a similar enough style that it's been... It's been fun to make the boat go fast, and we have been able to match each other. Feel free to shout out your past Olympic partners if you'd like, but what does Christy bring to the table that uh, is kind of that intangible Christy thing? Well, she's another person. So my last Olympics were in the single, so... <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Okay. Well, there you go. Like, that's the intangible, Christy. You're another person. <laughs> I'm her first Olympic partner. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So, so that, okay, so the other two are both singles. Okay, yeah, so I'm getting my head around the sport now a little bit. This is this is good. Um, but what about as far as, like, what's her strength that you've already noticed? What makes her such a great teammate? 
she's really calm under pressure um, and is able to stay focused on the race plan and everything we've talked about through a regatta. And I think especially in this trials going into it as a potential win winner, I was really impressed by how she stayed focused and kept calm and was able to work hard through all the stress of the situation. And it was great. It was really, it made it really fun and really easy. Was it stressful, Christy? Um, I mean, racing is always a little bit stressful. We race for like seven minutes a day and there are 24 hours in the day. So there's a lot of time to spend, um, you know, getting nervous. Um, but, you know, we had important races every day of the week. And I think we both did a good job just thinking about the race that day and preparing for, you know, the heat before moving on to the semifinal, before moving on to the final. And being more process oriented helps with, you know, the nerves. Is there a moment, Chris, uh, Christy, where you're kind of thinking to yourself, um, Olympics, it's just so hard. I mean, there's just so many obstacles. There's so many competitors. There's so many trials to get through. Is there a moment where you're thinking like, it's just going to be so hard to get there? Uh, one, that, that is question one. Two, I, exclu I uh, assume that having some more experience in your boat might give you that a little extra push. You know what, I'm in, in here with somebody who's been there before. That must be pretty, a pretty good feeling. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, I've just been trying to learn from Jevy ever since we got in the boat together. And she, you know, has a lot of experience. She's won a Olympic trial before, so twice. So, um, you know, I, I want to learn from her and, you know, add to the boat, um, but, I had never won an Olympic trial before. So, you know, being humble enough to know that and yeah. yeah. So was your celebration a little bit harder than hers, I would take it? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think we were both pretty excited when we finished. It really is, is Jebby, is it pretty, just as exciting every time though? I mean, I know there's no, there's no such thing as old hat I'm heading back to the Olympics, right? It was really not. It's absolutely as exciting every time. And I think this, trials in particular may have even been more exciting in a way than my trials in 2016. Um, in 2016, there wasn't a lot of competition due to a bunch of circumstances surrounding it. And this time we had a lot of competition and it's more fun to win when you are racing against fast boats and it makes it all the more satisfying. It also makes it even more special because it has been an unusual five-year quadrennial, if that makes any sense. <laughs> and that getting through that extra year has definitely added its own challenges. So to get to that finish line and to make it to Tokyo, really, it's special. That I do want to talk a little bit about that because that is like the the uh, elephant in the room or whatever you want to call it. Um, this has been obviously you're already pushed back a year, and now it's uh, still even today. Like we think we're coming out of this, and we think things seem good. And Japan says that this thing's going to happen and everything. But there's still, I mean, I'm sure in your mind, you're watching the news stories. And whenever some official comes out and says, you know, we have this surge or whatever, I'm sure you have to go, ooh, that, I don't like to hear that. Uh, what has it been like training, doing these meets? What's, what's it been like going through all this with kind of just that little bit of doubt? Because you need to be fully focused. That, that doubt can't help. Who wants that one first? You both like stared at each other. I mean, I like, saw the virtual stare at each other. That was priceless. I have to say that you can't think about that doubt because it will set you back as far as training goes. And so even when the reports were really bad last spring before the Olympics were officially canceled, we were training every day in the assumption that racing was going to go on because you want to be as prepared as possible for every, every race. And so we do what we can and we train and we assume that the Olympics are going to happen and that we're going to go as fast as we can this summer. Chris, do you want to take that same one? Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, I think for me, like controlling what you can control has always been a big theme and that just was kind of put to the test more than normal in this year. Um, I also kind of saw training, you know, even if it looked a little different than normal and not quite as, glamorous as maybe it would have been in past years as something that I could control and I could still control how hard I worked every day and that I was working towards you know my goals even if 
things, you know, I, I can't control if the games are going to happen. I can't control, you know, if people are going to be able to watch or whatever. So to me, it just seemed like I could control, you know, going to practice and giving my full effort every day. Yeah, it's a, it's a yeah. great answer. You, this being the first one, though, I'm assuming that it's, uh, you, I mean, you look at last year, I'm sure you're starting to see, like, last year, you, you two must have, I don't know where you were at last year. The whole thing changed after last year or what? New teammates, new everything? All right, welcome back. Quick bake. The, the dog, I think, is under control. They're very angry. I haven't taken them out today. The people on my side of the show who watch this regularly will know that's not an unusual thing. Uh, again, we're joined by Christy Wagner, uh, coming to us from New York. Jebby, uh, Jebby Stone coming to us from Cambridge. And I was just asking before Henry started freaking out here in the house. Um, last year, what was that like when the Olympics got canceled? Where were we at in the schedule? What were you doing? Were you about to qualify? What was the deal? Well, we were in different places. So um, mine was a little different than Jebby's. One race did happen last year, um, just before the Olympics were postponed. Um, and I raced in that race. It was a not a trial, just in um, speed order in California. So sorry, my dog is now barking. <laughs> um, uh, and um, so I raced in that race and then was actually uh, flew back to Princeton, New Jersey, which is where the um, U.S. women's national team primarily trains. And so I was there when the Olympics were postponed, but Jevy was supposed to race in the single trial, um, which was kind of a different scenario. Yeah, you had a weird story, right, Jevy? Yeah, so that was, uh, single trials were canceled as we were flying to Florida for trials. So we got to our layover and got texts that had been canceled that we should reroute back home to Boston. Oh my goodness, that must have been heartbreaking. It was pretty rough. Yeah, I mean, the plane lie. actually takes off. I mean, the plane took off. We thought everything was going to happen. It was like three days away, and things were looking really good for me to win singles trials at that point. And yeah, it was it was hard. Ah, well, that's it's it's terrible. People forget too. I mean, how maybe you don't forget, but people forget how quickly everything did. It just felt like the world kind of just stopped, you know. I mean, they're in the States here, there are, you know, basketball games going on. They just walked off the court. I mean, that's, those are the kind of things that were happening. Um, so what has been the, as far as like the, the, I know there's like social distancing probably between competitors, obviously you can't social distance uh, the two of you, but like, what is the pandemic changes like the actual sport? Has the sport changed at all or, or not really? Rowing's been lucky because we've been able to stay in the small boats in particular, mm. especially the single we've been able to stay entirely normal because you can't get six feet from someone in a single. Like you're going to be at least 10 feet from someone in a single just because of the length of the boat and the length of the oars. And that was wonderful during the early stages of the pandemic that there was something in life that felt remotely normal and that was rowing a single. And then it became a little bit trickier getting into doubles and bigger boats. And that was up to the club or the program or this, and, all by state guidelines in terms of restrictions on groups of people. And Christy, we talk, this will be a quick one. I'm gonna keep going rolling. This, one. this is now the mailman coming around. That's what I thought it was. There he goes. Very right, so the first time folks, it was the oil company that was here. So the, uh, we're getting it all done today. Um, Christy, we talked a little bit about the stress too on the water. That's the one thing, whenever I watch it, like I used to live near the Charles River in Boston and every time I would see like the colleges rowing, I always thought to myself, like it does look like it's the most like physical activity you can do. I mean, it's, it looks painful, stressful, all that stuff. Uh, I'm sure it is, am I right? Um. It's hard. I actually think when I watch other people do it, it looks really pretty and like can't imagine that I would ever look beautiful like other people do because when you're doing it yourself. Beautiful. It does look, it's a very, it's a gorgeous sport. I'm just saying it looks like the other things too. I know it's not easy to go at that speed. It's, it is pretty grueling. Yeah. Okay. Especially a lot of people talk about like a duck analogy that you're supposed to make it look pretty enough like a duck skimming across the surface of water but paddling like mad underneath. So you're working really hard, but you don't want anyone to see it. Oh, I like that. I, that brings it all home for me, I think. That's very good. 
I like that a lot. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to never watch that rowing the same way. It's fantastic. <laughs> Um, so what do we know about the field? What's like, what's the competitors? Um, like, are you, do you just automatically when you get to the Olympics, you think, okay, now we go for gold or do we have smaller goals? Like what, how does this work? I think the focus right now, I mean, we know that other countries are fast. New Zealand is the reigning world championships. The Romanians are the reigning European championships. The Dutch have been fast. Their Brits are coming through the system. Uh, but especially in rowing, you can only control, as Chris was saying, what you can control. And the point is to get from the start line to the finish line as fast as possible. So for the next few months, we get to focus on how to make our boat faster uh, so that we're in the best position to have our best races in Tokyo. Uh, Jibby, it, just, it strikes me, you know, you, I know Cambridge pretty well. Do you do a lot of Charles River rowing or has it been, uh, was there another spot that uh, you grew up on? Our life, yeah. Learn to row on it and that's where we're training now. That's what oh, currently you're training there right now. Yeah. And that's going to be it leading up to the Olympic? For the most part, yeah. Is there advantages to training there uh, when you compare like to where, what the Olympics will be? Or is it just kind of that's the water you feel comfortable on to get the work in? Um, I think it's the water we feel comfortable on. There's an amazingly supportive rowing community and our strength coach is local, other little things like that. Uh, but are not little things, big things like that. And Tokyo is supposed to be rough water and the Charles River Basin will help us because I'm sure it is going to provide that. You might even get an April snowstorm. <laughs> might even get a snow. <laughs> I don't think Tokyo will have snow in July. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Uh, Christy, the, uh, any New York uh, kind of uh, fury you've gotten when you've come into train in Boston? Is there any of that rivalry that sets in or? Um, well, I actually grew up in Boston, so uh, I just stayed with my parents. Um, I just came, I've lived in New York for four years, so I just came back to get some more stuff since we'll be in Boston for a while. So, so you're not a real New Yorker, that's what you're saying. No, I'm a real Bostonian. <laughs> What's your upbringing? Did you, were you a Charles River person growing up or? Uh... Um, we rode on the Charles a little bit. I actually rode in, I went to Weston High School and we rode in Wayland um, on Lake Tituate uh my high school team so it's like a basin of the charles but <laughs> uh, what was the uh christy you take this one first what was the best phone call you got from like a uh, i'm sure the family members were watching this closely um there were so many it was amazing i'd say my uh nine-year-old cousin in texas um was adorable and his whole class watched so that was pretty adorable and exciting Jebby? Um, I think the most ridiculous was a friend. I'm, a, I will go back to residency and a lot of my friends are doctors and one watched from the operating room and another watched from the emergency department while giving a patient pre-apneic oxygenation before intubating them. So I said, we're going to put this in a hole a little bit. <laughs> Good thing for oxygenation. Yeah. Wow. That is, that is special. Cool. That is exciting. And it, I mean, it must just be the, at some point, Jimmy, you'll probably even, I know you, you don't take it for granted, but at some point you'll probably, uh, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 20 years down the road, but you'll like kind of sit back and go, wow, three-time Olympian. That's like, not everybody gets to say that. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, I definitely, definitely hasn't hit home fully yet. I think mm -hmm. I still remember 2008 when I didn't make the Olympics teams and thinking that, there was no way I would ever become an Olympian because I didn't think that I was fast enough. Well, look in on that. What's that like? Because, I mean, obviously, they do say the losses stick with you harder, right? You learn more from the losses, I think, yes. The wins are more fun, but I think I have learned more from the losses, probably. That first time you qualified, do you think you – was there something that you tapped into maybe from that loss, like th this is where it went wrong last time, or – not even that this is where it went wrong. I was trying for a different boat class and it's a different experience, but definitely wanting to prove something and feeling like an underdog. Absolutely. You like the underdog mentality. Christy, how about like, so you do this for the first time, which I mean, I would imagine the first time has to be just like, like you can say for the rest of your life, you're an Olympian, which is like, I can still see it makes you smile. So that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it definitely has not sunk in to me yet. It was only yesterday, so, um, but it's you also- You have to process this? Come on. Uh, 
Um, I'm so excited. I'm just excited that we get to keep growing together. I mean, I obviously knew who Jebby was when I was in high school, so it's pretty cool. Um, and I just want to keep learning and making our boat as fast as we can make it. So. Were you, I take it, Jebby, I'm guessing, did you have to reach out to Christy or are these teams kind of made for you within the sport or just was you, were you like, I want Christy? How did that work? After singles trials, um, I had been part of a group and we finished second, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And I don't know if it was, my dad and Christy's coaches were the one, my dad is our coach and Christy's coach ended up talking and they were the ones first who arranged that. And Christy joined our group, which became six scholars to make three different doubles. And the other four rowers are now going to try to make the team for the quad. Okay, very exciting. One big happy family here. Um, what about my final few moments here again? We're joined here by Jebby Stone of Cambridge, uh, coming to us from Cambridge, Christy Wagner in New York, not from New York, don't get it confused, um, joining us here. Uh, Olympic uh, qualifying the other day, um, just hours removed, which is just fantastic. Uh, talked about some of the stories that they've gone through, some of the phone calls they received. Um, Jebby, what, what is the one thing you're going to want Christy to know about the Olympics? Is it like Olympic Village? Is it like the press stuff? I mean, you must have stories. I know you have stories. Yeah, I mean, I honestly think this is going to feel very different to me too because of all the COVID restrictions. Mm, true, yeah. I think, I mean, we're going there later and we're not able to stay for as long afterwards. And I think that, yeah, the whole it will all feel different because of that. The Olympic Village will not be its traditional Olympic Village in the partying sense of the word. Um, let me but, stop right there. Give it, what are some of those parties like past history? You know, it's funny because in London, actually, people think of the Olympic Village as a party site. And there are a lot of people who enjoy partying after their racing and their competition is complete. But we also are athletes first and foremost and respect that there are athletes in the village competing through the final day of competition. And in London and Rio, we would go elsewhere to do our partying. And it was actually amazing the dining halls, I mean, the McDonald's was open 24 hours and it would get really rowdy when we came back and we're eating breakfast at, from McDonald's at 5 a.m. But then the moment we left, everything was really quiet because everyone wanted to make sure the people who were still looking forward to competition were able to sleep and that it was a conducive environment to performance. Olympians eat McDonald's? After you're done. Track and field athletes eat beforehand, which I'm not sure if I recommend. But, and some basketball players, but as rowers, we stuck to afterwards. <laughs> All right, very good. Uh, the uh, Megan Duggan, the US hockey captain I had on here one day, and she said kind of a similar story of really when you're in it, when you're progressing, you have another game, it's like tunnel vision, it's all business. But then she said afterwards, it was like just, you know, they won, obviously, so it was a, a massive party. But then it was just a, a huge release. But she said the same thing. While you're there, it's like tunnel vision. Uh, Christy, what are you looking most forward to learn when you go to Tokyo? Because uh, it's going to be a whole crazy experience. I mean, I'm most looking forward to racing. <laughs> besides the racing. <laughs> I don't think we're going to do much besides the racing in Tokyo. Um, no, but I mean, even though it'll be a different experience, it will also be very unique, which is cool in its own way. And, and so just soaking it all in, I guess. Yeah. So, I think you'll be surprised. I think the most fun thing that will not change will be team processing when you get all your gear. And oh, yeah, that fun. that's, it's amazing. Yeah. I'm, you're going to need to feel really pretty special. <laughs> what? So when they actually, you so said when you get to see the red, white, and blue and all that? Yeah, so it happened in London, in London, and then we went through Houston on the way to Rio. But Team USA reserves a big structure, whether it's a school or a conference center, and you go station to station and you get all, it's red, white, and blue Christmas in July, is what we call it. It's, it may, they make you feel very special for being wow. a member of Team USA. Christy, that does sound cool. <laughs> She's like, I think it is. <laughs> How, and just, Jebby, for somebody who's done it now about to be three times, what is it like to wear those countries' colors and knowing that you have a nation pulling for you? Oh, um, it's a lot. I think it's an honor to represent the U.S. on that stage in general. Um, and 
I think for me, mostly the way I feel most connected is thinking about all those families and family and friends and everyone I know and all the communities throughout the country. I've trained in a lot of different states, a lot of different cities out of a lot of different boathouses over the last, gosh, a lot of years. And being able to bring a piece of those people to the race with me is it's special. That's so cool. Um, and Christy, you want to add to that? Um, I mean, I think, I think Jevy said, I agree with everything she said. It, <laughs> it's a tough one to follow. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, there are so many people that, you know, play a role and no matter how small, what they think their impact was, it was impactful. Um, and it means a lot. So. I bet it does. Uh, again, well, we are still rooting for the both of you, uh, Christy Wagner, Jevy Stone. Um, it, it's going to be fun to watch. And thank you for uh, letting me in on a little bit of some of this stuff. Um, it's not one of those sports that's in your face a lot. So you you kind of know it from distance. Yeah, I love the duck analogy. Never going to be able to think about this sport differently. I love that. Um, we're really rooting for you. Congratulations on getting there. It's just an unbelievable achievement. Uh, do you mind playing one minute of rapid fire with us to end the show? We try to learn a little bit of random stuff about our guests. Great. Let's yeah. do, Jebby, you take the first one, just where Christy gets the advantage of having the extra second. But uh, Jebby, favorite musician? Oh my gosh. Uh, currently, I've been into the High Woman. Ooh, I like them too. Um, I really like this band called The Kitchen Dwellers that is from Montana. My boyfriend introduced me to them. Very nice. Okay. Uh, let's see. Favorite movie? Of all time, rem rem Remember the Titans. Mine's Ocean's Eleven. Okay. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite city in the world? Boston. Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Just testing you, Christy. That's all. <laughs> Favorite food? Ice cream. Yeah, mine's probably ice cream also. <laughs> okay. So McDonald's and ice cream. There we go. Uh, the uh, best advice for the, uh, we get a lot of like high schoolers on this show watching this and, and younger. We have a lot, of, a lot of the high school athletes on as guests, but I know they look up to, little kids look up to them. And now a lot of the high schoolers are looking up to you. What's the best advice you have for that young kid that uh, says, whoa, I, I want to be an Olympian someday? Aim high and have fun. Yeah, never stop having fun and never, don't listen to the haters. Don't drink the haterade. <laughs> Very good. I like that. Christy, Jevy, wish you all the best. Uh, thanks for being patient with uh, not only me, but my dogs who are still, they're glaring at me. They are angry that we have not done our walk yet today. I'm going to have to go take care of them. Thank you both so much. This was a pleasure. Uh, wish you all the best. We'll be following your story and uh, good luck up until the Olympics and go win some stuff, will you? Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you.